I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about vortioxetine or Trintilex and whether it's any good for ADHD. So I'll start with the take-home message as usual and a reminder that this is for informational purposes only. It's not specific treatment recommendations for anyone. Vortioxetine, Trintilex in the U.S., Brintilex in Europe and other countries, is an antidepressant with a unique mode of action. It does have some serotonin reuptake action, but it's considered a serotonin modulator, so it's unique in the collection of different serotonin receptors it interacts with, particularly having strong 1A agonist activation properties and serotonin 7 antagonist or blocking properties. Both of those receptors, the 1A and the 7, are implicated in improving executive functions and cognitive well-being. There's extensive research showing that Trintilex or Deoxetine can improve cognition both in depression and in dementia, separate from how well it's working for treating the depression itself. In terms of ADHD research, there's only been one published study, and it was inconclusive. I'll talk more about that later. But overall, this is a medication that has a good track record for safety a large body of anecdotal information that can help with ADHD, but not much concrete research on that right now. Vortioxetine was approved by the FDA in 2013. It was actually improved in the U.S. under the name Brintilex, but by 2016, so less than three years later, it was getting confused so often with the blood thinner Brillinta that the name changed in the U.S., same exact substance, and again, it's retained the Brintilex name in Europe and other places. Company spokesmen pronounce it both as Trintelex and Trintelex, so I will switch around between the two. And again, this is a serotonin modulator. In the U.S., it's only approved for depression at this time, so it does have serotonin reuptake action, so it's approved in doses of 5, 10, and 20 milligrams for depression. And many people do get antidepressant action at 5 or 10, and at those dosages, serotonin transporter receptor occupancy is at 50% or less, whereas for pure serotonin reuptake inhibitors, it's usually in the high 70s to 90% receptor saturation where it's working. So it seems to be having effective antidepressant action where it's having very little to minor serotonin reuptake action. And this is confirmed clinically that at the lower two doses, the rates of sexual side effects at 5 or 10 milligrams are substantially lower than rates of sexual side effects on traditional SSRIs. And it's only when you get up to 20 when there is 20 milligrams where there is more SSRI action that you see that typical SSRI side effect. Actions that bordioxetine is known to have, one, it activates the serotonin 1A receptor. So this makes it like buspirone. I do have a video on buspirone. Buspirone is approved as an anti-anxiety agent. Other serotonin 1A receptor agonists like Jeperone have been approved for depression. So the 1A action itself seems to have some antidepressant action. It also seems to help with anti-anxiety action. For most people, mild pro-cognitive effects, pro-executive function effects, also blocks the serotonin-3 receptor. And we do have drugs that are pure serotonin-3 receptors. Those are drugs like Ondansetron, which is a anti-nausea medication. You would think then that this drug would be anti-nausea, and strangely, it has about the same rate of causing nausea as pure SSRIs. About 25% of people initially, most people on an SSRI, nausea goes away within a week or it only comes back on special occasions when other aspects of the GI system are under stress. But with 40 oxetine, about half of that 25%, so 10 to 15%, the nausea goes away like it would with an SSRI. But the remaining 10 to 15%, it seems to be continuing for months if someone can stick with it that long. And the manufacturer representatives from them have told me that they know the genetic reason why some people have that long-term, essentially permanent nausea effect with it, and that it's due to genetic factors. I have not been able to find any published research about that. Much of the interest in 
vortioxetine has focused on its blockage. So it's an antagonist of the serotonin 7 receptor system, second generation antipsychotics, particularly Latuda, but also Abilify, Rexulti, Risperidone. Other drugs like Trazodone have 7 serotonin 7 blockage as part of their mechanism of action. This seems to be how it's producing some of its pro executive function and pro cognitive effects. Fairly substantial body of research indicates that blocking the serotonin type 7 receptor results in increased synaptogenesis, particularly in the prefrontal cortex and maybe in the limbic cortex as well. Blockade of serotonin 7 may also be effective in blocking what are called the meta- metabolic effects of antipsychotics. So lots of people on antipsychotics develop weight gain process fats and sugars differently, have higher rates of developing diabetes. Other than synaptogenesis itself is that blockade of the serotonin 7 receptor system modulates a host of other neurotransmitters, particularly dopamine, but also glutamate, glycine, acetylcholine, particularly in the prefrontal cortex and in the limbic cortex. Serotonin modulatory action of vortioxetine doesn't stop there. It's also a partial activator the serotonin 1D receptor, and it's a blocker of the serotonin 1D, less extensively studied and thought to be less relevant to its clinical effects. So there is one study looking at ADHD and vortioxetine. It was developed by Lundbeck, a European company, and then at least the U.S. rights have been sold many years ago to Takeda. So I'm not sure who sponsored this, but it was a phase two study. After vortioxetine came on the market, there was a lot of interest in its procognitive effects, looking to see if it could be used in other situations, other clinical conditions, including ADHD and dementia. So this was a phase two study trying to develop vortioxetine for the treatment of ADHD. This was a study conducted by Joseph Biederman and colleagues and published in 2019. So well-respected researchers who did this, 227 adults with ADHD, and they were assigned to either 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams of Trintilex or placebo for six weeks. And then the non-responders were re-randomized. So it was a randomized controlled study. For another six weeks of treatment, non-responders could be randomized to any of the 10, 20 or placebo again. So what they found was there was actually an eight-point decrease in ADHD scale for the Trintilex groups. In many studies, would have been as significant and meaningful. That's a clinically meaningful degree of improvement. Unfortunately, the placebo group showed a comparable degree of improvement. So that was a major endpoint of the study. They also had some scales of daily functioning. And on that measure, actually, the Trintilex group separated from the placebo did better than the placebo group statistically significantly. And again, it wasn't a lack of an effect. This was a lack of differentiation from the placebo group that essentially put a halt to Takeda exploring ADHD indication for vortioxetine. What's important is that when they designed this study, they were anticipating a placebo response rate of about 35%. But what they got was closer to 56%. The design of the study was based on having at most 40%. I would say rather than this being a negative study, it's an inconclusive study. They would have needed to look at bigger numbers to see, given that this high placebo rate, whether they had an actual active treatment there. And then another strange aspect of the study and why it's, again, lack of of efficacy should not be too disconcerting is that there was an extremely high rate of non-adherence. So almost a third of people, blood levels of the drug in their body, were discrepant with how many pills were left in their bottle. That's particularly significant given that Trintilex has a long half-life, close to three days rather than about one day for many of our other antidepressants. I'd say the whole study is highly inconclusive. Other than that, there's no formal research studies with Trintilex for ADHD. There's a handful of case reports showing it can be safely combined with methylphenidate, that it seems associated with improvement in ADHD, although that couldn't be separated out from Ritalin, which the patients were also on. So that's the end of the story for formal studies, but there is a extensive amount of online discussion on Reddit and other groups of many individuals 
finding substantial benefit for the ADHD symptoms with Triplex. In the depression field, in contrast, there's extensive demonstration that a wide range of cognitive and executive functions, including processing speed, attention, memory, psychomotor skills, other executive functions, improve with ordioxetine, and that this is considerably more impressive than these cognitive and executive improvements with other antidepressants, not just a response to improving depression that some of these cognitive executive functions seem to improve more quickly than the mood effects and can be found in individuals who didn't particularly get a mood effect but did get a cognitive effect. And in fact, the manufacturer sought an indication for the cognitive aspects of depression for this drug. And the FDA denied that. They allowed them to say that it improves processing speed, but they don't have a separate indication. Whether this was because the FDA, FDA wasn't satisfied with enough data or more on a theoretical basis that the FDA did not want to get into the practice of approving a drug for a specific subset of symptoms for an indication when it was already approved for depression itself. Company and others outside of the company have conducted numerous studies looking at mild cognitive impairment, the early stages of dementia and early stages of Alzheimer's itself, as well as frontoparietal dementia. Some of these involve people who are both depressed and demented, showing not just cognitive decline, but an actual improvement in cognitive functioning and executive functioning in these individuals. And a few open studies, so at least we're not blinded studies, have indicated even in dementia where there is no depression present, vortioxetine actually improves cognition and continues to do so over the course of at least a year or two. So what are downsides? I mentioned nausea. That's the commonest reason I've seen people stop taking it. Some people who had some initial sleep issues or sleep problems. Interestingly, the, the serotonin 7 receptor system is also involved in regulating circadian rhythms. But cost has been one of the biggest barriers. So if your insurance covers it, great. But in the U.S., this is a drug that's about $600 a month out of pocket. It will be several more years at least before it goes off patent. Can't make any recommendations, but this is a drug with a good safety record. Again, likelihood of sexual side effects or SSRI side effects is substantially lower. Lower sexual side effects, lower emotional flattening or numbing out. It's highly unlikely to be problematic and maybe worth investigating for a broader number of people with ADHD than it's currently being looked at for. Take this information to your treatment team. Don't try this at home. This is not a specific recommendation for anybody. But stay healthy, stay happy, 